Welcome everyone. My name is Winston C. Thompson. I'm an associate professor of educational studies in the College of Engineer in the College of Education and Human Ecology, and by courtesy, associate professor of philosophy in the College of Arts and Sciences. I'm also a member of the steering committee for the Center for Ethics and Human Values here at the Ohio State University. I'm going to be serving as host today uh, for the conversation that we're having. Uh, this event is the first of our community conversations. It's the first in a series that's part of Ohio State's new Shared Values Initiative that aims to reinforce our university's ethical culture and live our shared values to better advance the university's core work of teaching, learning, research, and service. The goal of these conversations is to encourage reflection and discussion on the interconnected web of values that shape life and work at our university. Each conversation will focus on a different set of values. And these values include diversity and innovation, inclusion and equity, care and compassion, and integrity and respect. Of course, today we're gonna to be focused on the values of excellence and impact. And to some extent, these refer directly to Ohio State's vision and mission as a 21st century land grant university. In fact, in her recent State of the University address, uh, President Johnson quoted the Morrill Act that founded the land grant universities. And so our question today is, what does that mission mean for us as a university in this moment? Uh, before I introduce uh, our guest today and we engage in our conversation, I just want to flag for us all that uh, I'll also be seeking questions uh, from all of you. Uh, your voice matters here. And so given the fact that we wish to hear from you, uh, we'll, we'll ask that you please submit your questions in the Q&A box that you can find right there in your Zoom window. Towards the end of our time today, we'll shift the conversational focus uh, away from the, the two of us here who will be in conversation throughout the extent of our event uh, and towards your very good questions. Uh, those might either be follow-up uh, questions on ideas that we've discussed or new topics that you think are worthy of our attention and time relative to our theme. Uh, just one note that I'll make here is that uh, if you're anything like uh, like me, you're going to be inclined to want to listen first and then ask your question uh, at the end of, uh, of the time that we've got here. I'm going to tell you to resist that urge. If you've got a question, put it into the Q&A uh, as soon as it occurs to you. Uh, I'll be reading through and I'll select the questions at the end of our time together. Uh, but I, I encourage you to do this so that we don't find ourselves at the end of our time with you sort of scrambling to uh, jot down your question as you're still uh, uh, sorting through all of the good thoughts that you've been having uh, regarding uh, the conversation with our good guest today. And so speaking of the themes that we'll be discussing and the conversation that we'll be having with, uh, with our guest, uh, I ought to move towards introducing Harry Brighouse. Professor Brighouse is the Mildred Fish Harnack Professor of Philosophy of Education and the Carol Dixon Bascombe Professor of the Humanities and Affiliate Professor of Educational Policy Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He works in, among other subjects, ethics, political philosophy, and philosophy of education with an abiding interest in K-12 and higher educational policy and practice. He's the author of more celebrated books than I could easily name here, uh, but there are two which stand out. He's recently co-authored Educational Goods in 2018, uh, which is about how educational decision makers can integrate considerations of value with empirical evidence. And he's also the co-editor of the collection, The Aims of Higher Education, Problems of Morality and Justice, which was published in 2015. Professor Brighouse has long been engaged with questions of value as they drive educational institutions in their missions uh, in pursuit of their aims. And as such, he's the perfect first guest for our very first Shared Values Community Conversations. Please join me in virtually welcoming Professor Brighouse. Thanks for being here, Harry. Thanks for having me. So let's move into uh, the very first sort of prompt that I have for our conversation, the first sort of, uh, if you will, question that I uh, think we might focus our uh, attention upon. Uh, it's the case that 
uh, in 2015, you and Michael McPherson uh, co-edited a book entitled, as I mentioned earlier, The Aims of Higher Education, Problems of Morality and Justice. And in it, a number of celebrated scholars engaged questions of values at the very center of higher educational institutions. I guess just to get us started here, why did you think it was important to consider values in this context? I mean, uh, so much of what we do when we're thinking about uh, how we ought to proceed in higher education uh, perhaps might seem to be distanced from or detached from questions of values. Uh, so I invite you to say something about why you thought this was important. Yeah, so, so think, just think for a minute about hospitals or think about the health profession generally. Um, in hospitals, in public health, they understand very well that many of their decisions are responses essentially to ethical questions. So, you know, the one we have right now is, that, I mean, how should we prioritize the allocation of these, these vaccines? Who should get vaccinated first? And why should they get vaccinated first? Um, what moral decisions go into uh, deciding who should get vaccine, vaccinated first? And in education, and you know, in general, in higher education in particular, uh, we all think that there are lots of decisions that have a value dimension. You know, admissions and enrollment, funding, who to fund, how to fund them, uh, what and how to teach, uh, how to use our, you know, how to use our discretionary time, how to relate to the broader community, um, even questions about who should make decisions. Um, and so, I University mission statements often have lots of high flown rhetoric about service, you know, transformation, um, even learning for, you know, the value of learning for its own sake. And those, those invoke values, but those kind of statements are not helpful really when you're making difficult trade offs, which are the kinds of trade kinds of things you are doing when you, when you, when you're making real sort of decisions in context. And I think we really concretized the idea of the volume in the wake of the 2008 crash. And so what mm -hmm. happened in 2008 is you had especially, I mean, public institutions and the less wealthy private institutions were quite rightly worried about money. Mm -hmm. um, and many of them were having to make decisions uh, about what to cut, how much to cut it, um, you know, what, whether to honor, um, promises or soft promises that were made about funding um, and we were in conversation with a lot of leaders uh, of those institutions who uh, seemed to find it helpful to have a normative you know have an explicitly normative language mm. which to think about you know how to build on strengths uh, how to you know, how to, how to shift things around in a time of austerity, which, you know, an austerity is a time when you know you have to think about your values. Sure. Because, you know, thing, things just, are, it, it isn't, there aren't these easy sort of, you know, positive sum decisions to be made. Yeah, so I mean that sounds really interesting to me. Uh, in 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 my mind, I'm sort of beginning to think about uh, you know uh, uh, crisis as a moment in which we're sort of forced to confront uh, our values, right? Uh, uh, difficult times force these difficult decisions. You mentioned trade-offs, uh, and it seems to me that there are some who might respond uh, to the the uh, account that you've given and say, well, yes, but can't we simply look at the data, right? I mean, can't we simply, um, you know, look at the data, look at the trends and allow the data to drive our decisions? What is it about uh, uh, values uh, that becomes important in these uh, difficult moments that gets us beyond uh, where we might find ourselves if we were simply to look at, uh, for lack of a better phrasing of it, just simply look at the numbers, if you would? Yeah, so, I mean, uh... The data just are, data can't drive decisions. When you, you when you make decisions, you're trying to make something better or worse. I mean, hopefully better. Sure. Uh, uh, and uh, that's something that you, you use data. Data are really important because they help you know what the effects of your decisions are going to be, but they don't tell you what matters. I mean, yeah. it's like, I, maybe this is going to be a terrible analogy, but if I give you a map, the map doesn't tell you where to go. Mm. The map tells you how to get where you want to go once you figured out where you want to go. Mm. It, well, it doesn't tell you how to get there. It helps you 
it helps you get there. Um, but in itself, it's just a map. And that, yeah. I mean, that's how, and, and that's the mistake about thinking that data will drive your decision making. It's like thinking that a map will tell you where to, you know, tell you where you want to go. It, it just doesn't. Yeah, I think that, that that makes good sense. I mean, in some ways, it uh, reminds me again of the, the other book of yours that I uh, uh, mentioned earlier, Educational Goods, Values, Evidence, and Decision Making. And so uh, I hear you to be describing, uh, for those uh, who are in attendance here, uh, the idea that, you know, ultimately, uh, we've got to think about, we've got to engage with, whether we uh, recognize we're doing so or not, we've got to engage uh, with the values that are driving the sorts of decisions that we make. And so perhaps it's the case that uh, the question ought not be uh, whether we engage with values, but whether we are attentive to the values that are driving the decisions that we're certainly seeking to make, uh, animating for us or articulating for us our vision of what is in fact uh, a good change or a negative change. I, I often hear people describe themselves as being motivated for change, right? Uh, we want change, uh, but I think we want, as you said, we want good change, right? And so that's yeah. got to be a question uh, about values, it seems. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah. 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 So um, uh, given given that sort of background and given that uh, sort of um, uh, uh, broad defense, if you will, of uh, the importance of values and the work that we're doing and thinking about uh, what's going on, <clears throat> excuse me, on university and college campuses, um, I, I just want to, again, return to the, the, the first book of yours that I, that I mentioned, The Aims of Higher Education, uh, and say that um, in that book, uh, uh, you identified, uh, you and your co-author, uh, Michael McPherson, then the uh, president of the uh, Spencer Foundation, I believe, uh, you identify three categories of moral issues in higher education. The first uh, being sort of uh, questions about what gets taught in higher education, right? Questions about what gets taught in higher education. Secondly, uh, you identified as a general sort of theme uh, or category, questions about who participates in higher education. We might also ask ourselves uh, perhaps questions about how uh, the who participate in higher education. But then you had a third category here, which was uh, a category outlining the relationship between these institutions uh, and the wider world. And so I want to uh, encourage us to, uh, to sort of think about uh, that third category. Uh, so I want to invite you to share with our audience your sense of the types of questions that might rest within that third category regarding connections to the wider world. Uh, to what issues, to your mind, to what issues should a university be attentive when navigating its ethical relationship to its local community, to its regional or state context, and then, of course, uh, to the broader uh, and perhaps wider world that we might be considering here. So uh, any thoughts that you have uh, on this? Yeah, well, I'm not sure that my thoughts, I'm not sure how useful this is, but, you know, the first thing, the first thing is sort of, ob I think is obvious, is you figure out how to be of service to the community within, your which, within, within which you're located. And I think for land grant universities, that community has to be defined initially as the state. Mm -hmm. you know, the state is a, is, is a, is a major um, contributor to, especially to a, the funding of undergraduate education. It's the reason we are where we are. Um, you know, it, it's the founder, it regulates us. Uh, and I think, you know, we, we have to figure out how we can be of service, how to contribute, how not to be parasitic. Mm. Um, and then, make, you know, try and make that manifest. So listen, we supply all sorts of expertise. We train professionals who work locally and within the state. We are economic engines within the state. That's part of what we were designed to be. And that's what we seem to succeed in being. The people who work at the university in non-pandemic times uh, live in the community. You know, they live in the state. I mean, I'm, I'm a little anxious about what might, about what might happen, hmm. an increase in remote learning and remote uh, employment. Um, hmm. Uh, and and the, the, uh, some disintegration of the connection with the state from that. I mean, and that's true for all businesses. Um, uh, but we also have to be attentive to which members of the community get the most out of us. So, you know, are we serving? And I, th I, mean, I think if you look at our 
if you look at, in, for example, our in-state undergraduate population or our in-state population in our professional school, you know, in our postgraduate professional schools, um, it's not evenly drawn from all communities across the state. It's not yeah. evenly drawn. I mean, you know, we, we try, I'm, I'm sure Ohio State does too, to be attentive to uh, geographic diversity. And mm -hmm. of course, we try to be attentive to racial diversity and to some extent socioeconomic diversity, um, but we don't fully succeed in any of those things. Right. Um, uh, and, you know, are we training, uh, so if we're training high quality teachers, where do those high quality teachers go and work? Are we making sure that we are training really great teachers for rural schools? Are we making sure that we're training really great teachers uh, or, and nurses? Um, who are going to work in disadvantaged communities within, I mean, and beyond our state. Um, you know, where do our social workers work? Um, and when we are, when we're training professionals, you know, you know, nurses, uh, teachers, social workers, but also law enforcement officers, human mm -hmm. resource professionals, you know, accountants. I mean, we sure. we train a lot of those people. Um, how do we prepare them to provide? leadership in their professions and in their communities with the right kind of humility um so the so that's sort of the first set of questions i sort of think we have to have for ourselves um a second set of questions which I think is about more about our research, and maybe we'll talk more about this later. Mm. Um, is how do we disseminate knowledge and expertise beyond the student population? So, I mean, presumably, one hopes if we teach well, students get some of our uh, expertise and knowledge that is generated here. But you know, are we? Is the agricultural community, our businesses getting the benefit um, of the research we do? And here's why it's such a, here's why that's such a difficult, it's sort of obvious that we need to think about that. Exactly how you do that well is not, obvi is it not obvious, and here's why. We compete for researchers and teachers in an international labor market, sure. I mean, not even a national labor market. And this means two things. So the first is, you know, the labor market has numerous incentives built into it to elevate the global over the local. Mm. You know, I mean, you and I, like, you know, we probably talk to each other more than sure. any of our colleagues. Yeah. I mean, okay, we're both in the Midwest, but, um, uh, and if we were physicists or bio, you know, bioengineers or whatever, it, it, it would probably be even more so. Um, and then within the profet within the academic profession, you know, the incentives are very strong to uh, make an international reputation, mm. national or local reputation, um, to, especially in the tra traditional academic disciplines, to be interesting and innovative rather than useful. Um, uh, and you know, faculty who are drawn largely from other countries and states, um, and also largely from a relatively privileged social class, sure, uh, aren't aren't just sort of automatically well equipped to understand and connect with the people of the state, including, and I think this is very important for us state legislators. Yeah. Um, so. I think we need to think hard about all those kinds of questions with an understanding that, you know, of course there are, I mean, you know, there are people in the engineering school, there are people in the ag school, there are people who are just doing all this stuff like this is just the bread and butter of their life. And, and, and yeah. we, you know, it's really important to respect and acknowledge and send, you know, center that. Uh, I mean, yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, there's there's so much there's so much in what you in what you've said that I just uh, uh, want to sort of uh, uh, get in and and, and kind of uh, uh, engage with it because you're identifying so many interesting, uh, to my mind, motivations uh, as well as tensions, right? So on the first uh, in the first uh, sort of set of category in the first category that you offered, uh, you spoke uh, uh, a bit about sort of uh, the type of um, uh, expertise that can be transferred to students, but also the humility that students uh, would need to have uh, in order to use that expertise. Uh, towards some productive ends. Uh, and then in the second category in talking about benefits, um, I think that you're identifying some very real uh, tensions in trying to figure out how the university's values uh, might in fact be, um, uh, uh, might be manifest through the work that happens at the university. I think, you know, uh, you, uh, so, so I'll talk about myself first. Uh, I am not uh, a native Ohioan, right? I, I, I've, I've come to Ohio relatively recently. Uh, you're not a native uh, 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 son of Wisconsin, uh, uh, but uh, we find ourselves, right, engaged in the work uh, of, of these institutions, working for the good of the state. And I think uh, perhaps we might uh, begin to, to ask ourselves, you know, how the tensions uh, that, you, that you mentioned, the tensions between sort of uh, the global uh, uh, context and the local context, the tensions between uh, recognizing that we have members of our community who are uh, quote unquote transplants to the community and folks who are perhaps uh, uh, native uh, residents, right? Uh, again, as we think broadly about uh, not only faculty, uh, but begin thinking about students. You know, many of the students uh, in our institutions are from the state, right? Many of the staff members are from the state. And so thinking about how we might wed these communities together uh, such that we as a uh, sort of a, a broader, more general community uh, might begin to uh, anticipate and articulate the needs of the state uh, uh, seems to be uh, perhaps what we, might, uh, what we might do moving forward. Uh, curious to hear if you've got any sort of response or thoughts thoughts there no i absolutely think that's right um i think that we can do that better than we do mm. by having a more open kind of interaction and conversation with people outside the academy within the state yeah um, of course our i mean just of course our leaders spend like loads of their time doing that um and of course, you know, somebody who, you know, people who work in extension or people who work in, in, in uh, you know, in maybe, maybe, I mean, most obviously in the, in, in, in the ag school do that. Mm. Um, but through, you know, in the humanities, in the social sciences, in the natural sciences, especially the physical sciences, um, uh, it's not it's not sort of part of our reg it's not part, part of our culture to be mm. interacting and in thinking about our more you know there's the university's mission and then there's how we in our different levels and units and and as individuals contribute to carrying that out and thinking about how we do that I think takes um a broader conversation and it requires being in conversation with you know I mean students are a brilliant kind of I don't want to sound instrumental but you know students are a brilliant access point like yeah. you you can hear from students what they're thinking but you also hear from students what their parents are thinking and what mm. things are like in their community and the kinds of concerns and interests and worries they have and um uh and we have immediate contact with students um but but we could be talking to uh, you know we can we could be talking to legislators more it would be nice if we had more sort of uh non-leadership level interaction and contact between mm. you know fa faculty students and uh legislators both state level and you know uh, locally elected politicians mayors um etc yeah, I mean, I think you're, you're, you're putting forward a very nice vision for, uh, uh, you know, what the university could be and, and sort of how we might structure uh, the um, uh, connections to uh, the local uh, and the broader community. And I think as we're thinking about all of these um, constituents or stakeholders or uh, representatives or, uh, you know, uh, uh, community members uh, broadly, um, I think that we could also begin thinking uh, about the ways in which our considerations might need to be uh, forward 
forward looking and backwards looking, right? So it's the case that, um, you know, it might behoove us as uh, members of the community here at the university to begin thinking about, you know, um, uh, historical uh, uh, groups that have been, uh, groups that have been historically marginalized and ensuring that they've got access to uh, uh, engage in the very sorts of conversations that we're here describing, uh, contributing to our sense of the good of the state, right? Uh, the good of the, yeah. uh, of the people. I mean, I'm, I'm reminded of the ways in which, uh, you know, these land grant universities, uh, you know, uh, pursuing their good missions uh, as they are in this moment, uh, sit atop a, uh, a history in which uh, there is, you know, uh, the, the, the dispossession of uh, land of uh, native groups. I mean, here in uh, central Ohio, you know, we certainly have to uh, recognize in a non-exhaustive way the Shawnee, the Delaware, the Miami, the Cherokee, etc. Um, and, you know, with that backwards looking uh, uh, sort of perspective, we might also uh, begin then also looking, uh, looking forward, looking to the future uh, and thinking about, um, you know, whose uh, perspectives, again, are brought to bear on defining uh, this uh, shared good. I'd like to, to shift slightly here and sort of um, invoke uh, a piece of what I said earlier in that I noted that OSU has uh, recently uh, uh, articulated uh, the shared values that shape the lived experiences of all members uh, of our community. And so today we're really trying to, ho to home in on and discuss uh, the very first of these. Again, uh, we wanna uh, really focus in on excellence and impact. And so given the tensions that we've been talking about and the ways in which uh, folks at the university might, might be pulled in some very different directions, um, uh, I'm wondering in what ways might the pursuit of excellence um, uh, through the advancement of knowledge and perhaps impact uh, through thinking about public service, call members of our communities to be increasingly thoughtful about aspects of their work. In what ways should we consider the possible tensions of these long held commitments uh, to excellence and impact, particularly as we think of ourselves, yes, as faculty members, but also as students, staff, volunteers who come into our uh, campus uh, uh, activities, uh, members of the broader community and so forth. So questions here of excellence and impact, how should we think about them? Yeah, so, you know, I, I you know, as a philosopher, one of the things we, you know, one of the things we like to do is we like to do sort of conceptual analysis. So what exactly is excellence and what exactly yeah. is impact? And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do a fine grained uh, conceptual analysis. Um, but I'm just I, I'm, I want to be clear about how I'm interpreting it. So I sort of think, I mean, of course, excellence, excellence in impact. You can always resolve the tension. You can always say, well, what we want is excellent impact, no tension. But I think there really is a tension. Mm. And I think the tension is when we think about academic excellence, that is, we think about sort of intellectual excellence. Yeah, we are not. I don't think wrongly. Um, we tend to emphasize the abstract. We tend to emphasize the new. Mm. Um, we tend to emphasize, you know, I mean, I, I was recently part of a, a um, large research competition, a panel on the re research competition. And one of the one of the things was innovation. Yeah. Well, you know, like, do I want it? I mean, innovation is part of what makes is an important part of excellence in academia. But, you know, it's actually not that important. A lot of the times when you're trying to be useful, like, you know, yeah. you do not want a surgeon who is innovating while he's, you know, you don't want him or, or her, you know, cutting into you and then sure. thinking, I'll do a bit of innovation here. No, you sure. don't. You know, you want, you want them to be doing the same old boring thing that they do. Uh, and not, I, no disrespect. I mean, I know it's really hard, but it's, it's uh, so, and if you think about disciplines, I mean, philosophy is a discipline like this. Mm. I think uh, economics is a discipline like this where, you know, there's high prestige attached to attached to very abstract work, and lower prestige attached to applied work, yeah. um, work that is more likely to be more useful. And I'm not, I, I don't think that's necessarily a wrong um, uh, hierarchy. Uh, but you have to think about the incentives. So you want to think, okay, uh, these are both important things, excellence and impact, abstraction and usefulness. They're both very important and they're both part of our mission and we need to pursue them and we need to get the balance right. And so you ask yourself, okay, so what, how do we align incentives 
so that we get that balance right. And mm -hmm. one thing to look outside. So when I look when I look in academia, when I look at the way oh, this is just for faculty, when I look at the way the um, academic labor market works, when I look at the way the tenure works, when I look at the way um, that status hierarchies work within disciplines, it seems to me the incentives are tilted more toward excellence than toward impact. Mm. I mean, you know, it, toward usefulness. Um, and so what the university has to do locally uh, is just counteract those incentives some. I mean, just to shift things into a better balance. And we have to make a decision about what the, what the best balance is for us. Um, and it's the same around, you know, it's the same around uh, preparing professionals. Um, you know, I mean, I don't, there's no way of saying this without sounding disrespectful to somebody. But, you know, uh, do, you know, is nursing really of less importance than, you know, are nurses really less important than physicians? Because mm. for sure, physicians have higher status. Mm. Are, you know, teachers and educators and social workers really less important than lawyers because they for sure have lower status mm. and uh, we don't want the status hierarchy on our campuses just to automatically reflect the status hierarchy mm. uh, that, 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 that the you know the mainstream world gives us we want to be deliberate and purposeful about how how we manage that uh, status hierarchy ourselves now i mean there, it, there are two important di dimensions to incentives, uh, and one is cultural, right? I mean, one is sort of an ethos. I mean, it's important that people are held in esteem for doing the things we value. Um, and, you know, in, in Wisconsin, we have this, this uh, the idea of the Wisconsin idea, which was sort of formulated by uh, Van Hise, a president in the early 20th century, uh, who said, I shall never be content until the beneficent influence of the university reaches every family in the state. Mm. And we do talk about the Wisconsin idea a lot, and it does shape, I think, some of our decision making and our thinking. And that's a kind of that 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 is a sort of incentive. I mean, that's an, you know, it's a way of according status. But the other dimension of incentives is money. I mean, you know, like you know, your values reveal your budget and your budget needs to be led by your values. And uh, so, you know, so we need to some extent to put our money where our mouth is. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, again, it's like everything I'm saying, this is not meant as a criticism of uh, the, it's not like some revolutionary criticism of existing structures, we're doing everything wrong. No, we're not, we're doing a lot right. And it's a, it's a matter of being self-conscious about right. what, right and trying to figure out how to align what we're doing better with our values than it already is yeah i mean i really like what you've said about sort of the intentional design of incentive structures such that we might uh on the one hand you know uh, begin to sort of promote the values that uh, uh, uh that we claim ourselves to hold uh, but on the other end i suspect that we, what we might do in attending to the incentive structures is begin to reveal to ourselves, you know, what our actual, uh, what values we're actually sort of living. Uh, and perhaps the sobering uh, uh, experience of, of confronting ourselves, um, as we all, I guess, would hope to do individually, uh, collectively uh, and institutionally, that, uh, that, that moment would be a moment of uh, some real recalibration. And in some ways, uh, just to connect to your earlier comments about sort of trade-offs and these difficult moments of crisis and so forth, uh, perhaps, you know, uh, looking at ourselves uh, uh, more directly, looking at our values more squarely in moments that are of relative calm uh, might be a way to kind of get at some of those uh, questions of values uh, that otherwise uh, would not uh, uh, be manifest in our in our sort of consciousness unless we found ourselves in the difficult moment of crisis, right? So uh, we might avoid placing ourselves in those difficult circumstances um, uh, by uh, uh, intentionally addressing questions of value yeah yeah so, absolutely uh, yeah. and when we do find ourselves in those problems we're better equipped to get ourselves out of them absolutely 
Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, so in some ways, you know, just to just kind of uh, stick a little bow on it here, um, I think, you know, the ongoing conversation that we've been having in this country, and perhaps uh, not just in this country, but across the world, uh, during this, uh, uh, you know, difficult year that we've been experiencing, uh, regarding essential workers, right, uh, thinking about, yeah. you know, whose work is valuable, right. valuable for what purpose, valuable how, uh, you know, who do we need, right? I mean, those sorts of conversations, again, a crisis uh, stimulating some uh, reflection on our values and our evaluations of workers, uh, that sort of thing uh, perhaps um, is uh, uh, a necessary part of uh, the university uh, community attending to itself, right? Asking itself, uh, you know, who uh, uh, within our community, students, faculty, staff, et cetera, you know, uh, who are we undervaluing and how might we alter our structures so that we're appropriately valuing uh, those persons upon whom we most rely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Good. So uh, what I'd like to do now is, um, since we're, we're, we're talking a bit about uh, questions of um, uh, of vision, questions of, uh, of, of mission, what I'd like to do now is um, uh, uh, return to uh, what I stated earlier regarding uh, the fact that a lot of our conversation here uh, really ties into uh, the Ohio State University's uh, vision and mission. So uh, I'm not going to read through uh, everything here, but uh, it's the case that the Ohio State University's vision uh, is that uh, OSU stands as a model of the 21st century public land grant research urban community engaged institution. Uh, and a, sort of uh, associated with that of course, is a relatively uh, full sort of mission statement. Um, uh, it sort of covering uh, many of the, uh, um, the values uh, that I uh, mentioned earlier. So I'm curious, uh, you know, since we've, we've got you here, and given the way that our conversation has been unfolding, I mean, how can faculty, staff, students, uh, again, volunteers, other members of the community, researchers uh, who don't fall into these categories, um, uh, the doctors on our uh, hospital uh, uh, and medical uh, um, um, uh, institutions that are associated with our, um, our, our campus here, uh, how can we all begin demonstrating leadership in pursuing uh, these aims from within the context of the respective roles that we hold. You know, how might uh, persons begin to navigate some of the reasonable uh, differences? And I, I, I you know, want to be mindful here, focusing only on reasonable differences uh, of values between themselves and other community members. So um, again, the question that I'm sort of posing for us here is given the, the, uh, the values uh, uh, that are entailed in our, our vision and in our mission, you know, how might persons in their various roles, uh, how might they move towards uh, uh, achieving uh, some of these, uh, these values? Um, uh, and how might they navigate the fact that, you know, uh, different persons interpret these values in radically, in some moments, radically different ways. So the first thing is, um, you need self-knowledge. Yeah. So you, you need to know who you are and you need to know who you are relative to who you're talking to. And, you know, faculties, uh, I'm sure this is true at OSU, it, it is all over the place, um, tilt heavily to the left mm. when it comes to politics relative to their populations, their states, I mean, certainly in your state and mine. Sure. And built heavily to the secular relative to the populations in their state. Sure. I'm sure your student body tilts that way too. Ours does, though it does less so than the faculty does, and it does less so than it thinks it does. I mean, sure. our students are less left wing than our students think they are. Um, mm. uh, and uh, because we all live together in the same area, we work together, we are inter interact with each other. Um, uh, and, you know, people at universities are smart and thoughtful, people who are not universities are too, but um, it's very easy in that environment to assume that everyone shares your views and to come off, frankly, as entitled and arrogant when you mm -hmm. interact with the rest of the world. Sure. Um, and, you know, to some of our students who hear offhand comments that seem dismissive of them or, or of their parents or whatever, um, it, it, it doesn't sit right and mm -hmm. it doesn't... Uh, and, most many of our students have heard such things in a classroom or around a classroom um and when you are yourself remarkably privileged which by definition someone with tenure at a land grant university is i mean it is a kind of job security that is unparalleled in modern economies 
Sure. Uh, you know, I mean, I sort of joke, Prince Charles, he has more job security than I, you or I do. Sure. Uh, but, you know. That's about it, yeah. You know, I mean, that, yeah, exactly. So you have to be very attentive to that and think about how you sound. Mm. You're talking to other people who are essentially, I mean, not that this is a fundamental thing, but who are paying your salary, who are, you know, who are trust and who are trusting you um, with uh, their children, who are trusting you with their children's future teachers, who are trusting you with their children's future nurses and doctors. And um, uh, so I think that's, that's the first thing. I think we need to be very sort of self-aware and self-conscious and aware of all the temptations to be dismissive and whatever. Um, I've, so that might or might not be useful. Um, I have a second thought that, you know, again, might or might not be useful, which is I would, you know, leadership involves initiating and pursuing more conversations with more people and more groups of people who can learn from us and from whom we can learn. And, you know, a conversation which you enter without the expectation that you're going to learn from it is not a conversation. It's a, it's a soliloquy. Mm. Right. And, uh, and you're not going to have many of those because people aren't going to put up with it. Um, uh, um, and I think, you know, we could, again, this, of course we have outreach organizations on our campuses and they do important and valuable work, but I would like to see more sort of, uh, I don't know, authentic kind of embedded mm. outreach and what I sort of think of as in reach. So, mm -hmm. you know, when we, when we have panels, when we have uh, events at our, uh, on campus that are about matters of public concern or public policy, who are we inviting to them? Is it just academics? Um, if it includes legislators, does it just include democratic legislators? Mm. Um, uh, does it include, you know, are we getting uh, legis? I mean, we're, you know, Madison, we're in the capital of the, of, uh, oh, oh yeah, you are too. We are as well, yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, uh, you know, are you bringing legislative aides? Are you bringing civil servants? Are you bringing people who, as I say, you, you know, you want to learn things, but also who in dialogue you're going to be learning from. So I, you know, that sort of, I don't know how useful that is, but, but, but those are two things that I was sort of thinking about. Well, I think it's incredibly useful. I mean, as I hear you do have articulated things, on the one hand, uh, you know, that self-knowledge that you're uh, describing sort of seems to link back to your earlier statements regarding uh, humility for students. Uh, I'm hearing also something that now suggests a kind of broader uh, form of humility. That is to say, um, <clears throat> realizing or recognizing the degree to which uh, interacting with, um, you know, members of a diverse uh, uh, community will require a uh, particularly coming from a position of uh, relative privilege, will require a, a certain degree of humility and also that sort of uh, outreach or, or, or inreach, uh, to use your terminology, uh, will require curiosity. So I, I, I guess what yes. I'm hearing from you is um, uh, perhaps on the one hand, uh, humility uh, that is linked to uh, sort of recognizing uh, that we need to earn the trust of uh, those who have entrusted us with, in some sense, uh, the future of their communities, right? So um, yes, their uh, children are coming to the university to spend time here, and that's a, an element of trust that we need to earn. But also it's the case that in sending their children to the, to the, uh, to the university, they are entrusting us with uh, the creation of um, uh, or uh, some contribution towards the creation of a shared uh, future. And so that trust needs to be earned and we ought to be curious uh, uh, in uh, reaching out to try to understand uh, those around us. And that curiosity perhaps uh, leads to the, or, or, or is an avenue towards the type of leadership um, that I certainly heard you to be describing. Um, Given the amount of time that we have remaining, uh, I was going to ask you uh, to say something about sort of forward looking or, or future oriented uh, uh, ideas. And I think we might be able to integrate that into some of the questions that are coming in uh, through the Q&A box. Uh, so to those of you who are watching from your desks or your tables uh, or uh, enjoying uh, good weather and sitting outdoors, perhaps with a mobile device, um, uh, uh, do continue to put your questions in the Q&A. Uh, I see that we have quite a few here, so I'm going to 
try my best to weave some of them together. Um, so you might not hear the particular uh, wording of your question, but uh, I hope that I can capture things. Um, so one of the, 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 the first questions that we have here is whether or not uh, it would be wise for us to um, uh, disentangle the good of the people from the good of the state. That is to say, uh, might there not be uh, some moments in which uh, the tension that we've got to think through uh, might be a tension that really uh, presses against uh, some of our state uh, um, uh, indexed um, uh, aims. That is, um, <clears throat> perhaps doing what's good for Wisconsin uh, or doing what's good for Ohio uh, uh, might in some ways frustrate uh, our aims towards doing what's good for you know, Americans or uh, people uh, in the world more more broadly responses yeah, I, no absolutely so the, and that's just a a tension that we have to manage and live with no i, I mean we, we we don't just serve our state we serve you know we serve the world we, mm. we, we have we, you know we we have expertise which are valuable well beyond the state and sometimes yes we absolutely will have to trade that off it's not um, it, you know, I, I, I really appreciate the Wisconsin idea. I, I do want the beneficence of the university to touch every family in the state, but that's not mm -hmm. all. Um, I want it to touch other, you know, other parts of the world too. Um, we're, we're too big to only be concerned with the state. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you know, it's the sort of theme of humility and self-consciousness, like, you know, self-awareness, like, okay, we, we have these two things that we need to be concerned with. And we, when there are trade-offs, we need to think hard and well about them um, and think about, you know, are we, in, in some cases, like, are we, are we fooling ourselves that we're serving either, are we really just serving ourselves? Mm -hmm. um, uh, or, and if we are serving the world at the expense of the state, well, sometimes that's legitimate and proper. And sometimes it's, it's not. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't have a rule that can guide us. Well, so, so, so towards thinking about <clears throat> how we might navigate some of these uh, tricky moments, difficult moments, I see that we've got a, a Wisconsin-centric uh, question that uh, might uh, uh, provoke us towards uh, 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 finding a rule. But uh, the question here uh, from Jamie Herman is a question, uh, how do we address uh, and breach disagreement between the university and state or federal legislature when the underlying value structure and language usage of each party seems so disparate? For example, when Governor Walker shifts the mission of Wisconsin higher education uh, towards workforce development, is it the responsibility of land grant institutions to follow through on that mission, or ought they defend the values of those who have to enact that mission within the university, uh, that is academics, uh, who might fundamentally disagree with the very essence of the, uh, of the university's uh, project? So how, do we, how, how might we navigate some of that? Yeah. The one thing is, so um, of course, at the extremes, there are points at which you, you know, you, you, you rebel. Yeah. But no, work, I, I mean, I just, I, I just don't, I think it's crazy to think workforce development doesn't matter. Right. It's crazy to think that we are not an important part of that. We are, we, we, we train teachers, we train nurses, we train, you know, yeah. we uh, train business people. Like, uh, we should do that self-consciously and well. We should, um, uh, and the, la the language, I mean, the, on the day that that, I mean, I'm not gonna take people through the history of Wisconsin, but you know, on the day that that sure. language change was proposed, you know, at the first, at the beginning of the day, it was this sort of extreme gutting of the Wisconsin idea. And by the end of the day, the actual language proposed was extremely mild and moderate. Sure. Um, uh, but yeah, like I mean, if 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 the if the change had been, we should only be involved in workforce development and nothing else, and we should not be training teachers or nurses or whatever, but only business. Well, uh, yeah, that's correct. I mean, we the University of Wisconsin shouldn't only be doing that, and I would expect our leadership to fight back on that, and I would expect uh, the faculty to fight back on that. Um, I also don't think that's what I, I mean. I don't anticipate that. That kind of uh, demand. Sure. Um, the, the actual demands that are being made are uh, sort of within the scope of reasonable disagreement. And uh, just last thing about this. Sure. 
it really helps to have relationships with people. Mm. It really helps to have, and to, you know, you do not want the first conversation you have with mm. the legislator to be, I disagree with you and you're wrong and stop it. Sure. You can do that if you want. But that's not fruitful and helpful. You want to have the, the the you want that to be the fifteenth conversation you have with the legislator, right? After you've had conversations about the things that you're interested in together, the things that and and I think that I mean, I think that's been a I feel not from our leadership, but I feel from the faculty there's a kind of failure to take responsibility for leadership in those kinds of relationships. Hmm. Um, and that's the inreach, you know. Yeah. We should be having all our legislators on campus regularly, they're a, they're they're not even a mile away. Sure. Yeah. I mean, so I, I, I mean, they are that, now. But <laughs> well, yeah. So yeah. Now, now it's a it's a difficult time. But under under uh, sort of uh, standard circumstances, I mean, I find that idea of inreach to be very provocative and very um, uh, illuminating. Um, and so, just as a follow up to that uh, uh, statement that you've made here about reaching out and so forth, uh, we've got a question from. Uh, uh, Zoe uh, Plakius, uh, who uh, is an economist uh, here at uh, OSU's College of Food, Agriculture, and Environmental Sciences. Um, and uh, Zoe states that, um, that they want to be able to have the sorts of conversations that we've been talking about, right? To speak with stakeholders, um, uh, to speak with uh, sort of the broader community. Uh, but it's been a struggle in, uh, in recent years. Um, are there any models that we might uh, uh, perhaps offer um, uh, of this process or programs or centers that might serve as uh, some good examples in facilitating dialogue, particularly dialogue that can transcend political divisions? Yeah. So that we might engage uh, and better learn how to do this difficult work. I mean, that is so hard. And, you know, the answer, I mean, frankly, the answer is I don't have any models. I have, if you like, this is going to sound terrible, but like guerrilla activity. Sure. Um, um, and, 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 you know, I mean, sort of a couple of years ago, I had two, I invited two legislators, one a uh, quite left-wing Democrat and the other mm. a right-wing Republican um, to my political philosophy class. And I invited them both because they were friends. I mean, they, they were sparring partners. They were intellectually okay. uh, friendly with one another. And the Democrat who by that time had left the legislature and was a mayor out in uh, Racine, mm -hmm. uh, he, he had like a 20 inches of snowfall, so he couldn't turn up. So his, so the, the other state legislator Slater turned up to my political philosophy class. And it was, and I was a bit anxious because I didn't know him and I did know the other guy. Um, I mean, really well, I'm good friends mm. with the other um, And I kind of wanted them together and I knew the students weren't that comfortable actually with having a re Republican legislator in the room. I mean, I knew a number of them weren't because they told me. Okay. And it was a very productive, useful, thoughtful exchange and interaction. Um, and of course, it, it, it helped to build a relationship. I don't, see, I don't see a way out of the kind of polarized, you know, hostile, we don't listen to you and you don't listen to us politics that doesn't involve, first of all, that doesn't involve universities. And secondly, that doesn't involve, you know, personal embodied interaction in which you locate the sources of disagreement. Mm. Um, uh, you know, are we actually disagreeing about facts or are we disagreeing about values or are we disagreeing about how we weigh the values? Right. And, and you know, people are much more willing to listen to people that they sit in a room with I don't know why, but they are, then they are people who they're not in a room with. Um, and, and, and we have this sort of unique ability to facilitate that kind of room sharing mm. that, you know, I mean, very, very wealthy businesses, I guess, can do it. But, they, you know, we, we, we can do it with, uh, we're very close to the places where power sits. I mean, local power sits, and we're articulate, and they're articulate, and we, you know, 
lots of them went to our institutions. Lots of them were graduates at our institutions. I mean, it's like, you know, they're alumni, not yeah. all, but, but an, a, enough of them. Yeah, but it makes sense. I mean, it's a, it's a very um, a very sort of um, uh, obvious, uh, perhaps, inroads to uh, to having some of these uh, uh, more difficult and more fulsome conversations. I mean, I, I'm hearing in your in your response, you know, uh, the idea that the university, of course, uh, you know, may have its own sort of uh, questions of values to navigate, but stands as a really sort of unique uh, context for navigating uh, 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 disagreements across value. Um, you know, if it's not happening in the university, uh, we might ask ourselves then, you know, where else uh, uh, do we expect it to happen? And so I could imagine that there are ways in which, like yourself, um, faculty members can think about um, uh, cultivating or creating contexts in which um, students can really um, begin to see uh, how values are negotiated, uh, uh, you know, when folks uh, hold some, uh, some disagreements. But I can also begin to imagine the ways in which uh, members, you know, staff members uh, might uh, uh, find themselves able to contribute to uh, creating uh, contexts uh, on our campus uh, for these types of conversations that are going to be difficult, but uh, ultimately are going to be of considerable value, um, given the background sort of disagreements that are occurring within our community. Communities. The final question that I'll pose to you here is a question that is in some ways forward looking. Um, one of the, the questioners asks, how can higher educational institutions better ensure that its community members, particularly its leaders, turn to values in those moments when they're faced with complex, difficult issues that need to be resolved? And I expect this person means sort of consciously turn to their values. In addition to ongoing conversations and reflection about our shared values, how can we drive values-based decision-making across our universities? Are there any practical tools, perhaps such as shared decision-making frameworks, that we think might help? Seems like a wonderful okay, I'm gonna, to I hope you're not going to think I'm trying to create jobs for philosophers. Um, but, you know, every hospital has an ethics committee. Mm. You know, ethics committees and, and uh, ethics committees are not constituted just of trained ethicists, though they're, they're part of an ethics committee. They, there are professionals. There are other kinds of stakeholders on there. There are obviously lawyers. Um, and you know, I don't know of any school. I don't know of any department of public instruction. I don't know of any university that has an ethics committee. I mean, yes, there are research ethics committees. Yeah, a committee that is able to, you know, think in a sort of uh, unfettered, think out loud, uh, sensible way and give um, advice, not necessarily unitary, you know, not, necessar not necessarily advice that is just with one voice. Sure. But having, having an institutionalized space for people who do not have decision-making power, like, you know, an, an ethics committee has to be advisory and advisory only. It has to be... Um, it would have to map out the values, map out the space, um, and provide a sort of framework for people to have those kinds of conversations. I think that would be at minimum interesting, uh, at, at best, you know, quite helpful. Um, and that's the only that's the only institutional suggestion I have. Mm. For all sorts of, uh, of, you know, the other things are all sort of well, be more self conscious, like. Sure. Think more about what the values are that are at stake. Try and have conversations that aren't, you know, that don't begin with disagreement. I mean, disagreement might prompt the conversation, but the conversation doesn't begin with you're wrong and I'm right. Sure. It begins with, okay, where do we disagree? Why do we disagree, et cetera? Um, what, what do we really value? Is, are there exceptions? So non-combative, um, but, but um, uh, deliberative sure. conversations. So, I would like an, you know, even more of an ethos of that than we have. But I think I think an ethics committee. I mean, I've been thinking about this a lot because of the pandemic. Sure. And the ethical dimensions of the decisions that leaders have had to make during the pandemic, and the and the way that in the public health community, ethics, you know, ethics committees have played an extraordinarily important role, especially in the rollout of the vaccine. Of course. And just that hasn't been. Of course, good leaders have people who are who they talk to and hear from who are doing this kind of thing, you know, non-institutionally. Sure. And I, I know many of them do that. 
Um, but having something in the institution that is charged with that would be, I'd be in favor of it. And I think, so I would certainly be in favor uh, of something like this, uh, to no surprise to you, of course. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, all of the members of the Center for uh, Ethics and Human Values uh, would, would, would be on board as well. I, looking at the clock, I see that we are unfortunately out of time, uh, but we've had such a rich conversation today that uh, uh, Professor Harry Brighouse, I just want to thank you on behalf of The Ohio State University for uh, giving us your time, your attention, and your thoughtfulness as we think about shared values in this, uh, in this moment. Uh, to all of those of you uh, who are, who are uh, watching this event, uh, please know that we will have uh, further uh, community conversations uh, following up uh, on the Shared Values Initiative, uh, so do keep eyes open for that and join me in thanking Professor Harry Brighouse for his time and attention. Thanks so much. Thanks, Winston. Of course.